So I, I would like to say a few thank yous myself um, before we start. Um, so first of all, a thanks to Dean Minow um, for being here. Um, when I was in law school here, I had the great uh, privilege of having Dean Minow as the supervisor on my third year paper. Um, and uh, what a tremendous, um, what a tremendous scholar, and what a compassionate person! Um, and it was a real honor to be able to work with her. I also want to extend my thanks um, to uh, the folks who organized this event, and Chris Christine uh, Azaro and um, and Genev uh, Campbell, who's not here today, uh, Molly McDonough and uh, Ebba, uh, Mark, and also uh, Sherry Ramirez have put a lot of work into this, and I really appreciate that. I also I also want to acknowledge um, that this. Uh, this conference comes about as a partnership um, between two university-wide initiatives here at Harvard, um, the Berkman Center for Internet and Society, which is the home um, for the Global Access and Action uh, Project that we'll talk about a little bit here today, um, and also the Harvard Global Health Institute. Um, and that partnership has been an extremely um, rich and uh, valuable one for us, and one that, um, uh, that I think will uh, will bear a lot of fruit for us here today. Um, I want to thank two other partners um, before we um, get into the substance here. Um, as many of you know, we wrote a discussion paper in connection um, with this conference here today, and hopefully we can spend a little time um, talking about some of those ideas. Um, and uh, the research uh, budget for that was uh, made possible by uh, the National Foreign Trade Council Foundation, um, and so we want to thank them. Um, we have another partner um, who has also contributed significantly um, to our effort in a pro bono capacity, um, which is the law firm of, of Wilmer Hale. So thank you to, um, to all of those partners. Um, I, I want to sort of start where Ashish um, started, which is that there are enormous challenges um, that we face here in the global health uh, landscape. Um, and I'll mention just a few of them. Um, you know, one of them is just the startling disparities that exist um, by virtue of uh, mere accidents of birth. Um, and uh, you know, one of the things we cite in the paper um, is the stunning fact that if you're born um, in Cambodia, um, you are 18 times more likely to die before the age of five than if you're born in Iceland. It's shocking, it's intolerable, um, and one of the things that inspires us here today is to try to figure out um, some things that we can do about that. Um, two other challenges um, that are maybe a little bit closer um, to the topic of the, uh, the conference today. One is um, uh, just that there are millions of people around the world who die because they don't have access um, to solutions we already have for diseases we have already cured. Um, and then another side of this challenge um, is um, that there are insufficient resources devoted to research and development um, to solve problems that primarily affect the world's poor. So when we look at an outbreak like Ebola or like Zika um, and think, why? Why hasn't this problem been solved? Um, in some ways, that's actually a policy problem. There aren't sufficient commercial incentives uh, to um, incentivize the research and development um, that would go into curing that set of problems if it were uh, a disease that affected uh, richer people. Um, and the ways in which our um, incentives are set up for research and development um, simply don't fit very well um, with those categories of diseases. Um, so these are big challenges. Um, and it's, it's easy, as it is with the tragic events over the weekend in Orlando, it's easy to despair um, and to get frustrated and angry. Um, it's also easy to feel that we need to solve everything before we can solve anything. Um, and it's easy to get angry. I'm, I'm angry about this. Um, and uh, it's easy to get angry about the unfairness that confronts us when the accident of, of somebody's birth um, has such a stunning relationship to whether they have access to, uh, to health care that should be right. Um, but I think that we can be, I, th I think that we can be angry and we can also have differences of opinion in the solutions to these problems, um, but also do so in a way where we can disagree 
about particular approaches uh, without being disagreeable. And one of the things um, that I'm excited about is this, is this is a wonderful group of people coming together uh, to look at these challenges. And, and, and I think that we can roll up our sleeves and be uh, productive in the ways that we talk about concrete solutions. Um, so these are big challenges, um, but fortunately, great work is already being done in this space. Um, and I'm so excited to have such a wonderful mix of people here today um, from industry, from uh, the nonprofit sector, from foundations, from academia, from government, um, and to learn from you about um, what you're doing in these spaces. Um, and um, so our approach here was essentially, let's bring together the smartest people we can find, put ourselves in a room, and challenge ourselves to come up with solutions. Um, and so Ashish gave a little bit of an overview of the day, but let me, let me give you my own um, take on it, because I'd like to challenge us um, to do three things. I'd like to challenge us to think of these as a set of urgent problems for which we want to come up with solutions that we can implement without delay. I want us to think about bold solutions, game-changing innovations that can have a transformative impact. Because if you have such a huge problem, um, you need huge solutions. And then I also want to challenge us to be concrete and to think about actual next steps that we can do with other people in the room that will help us to move the ball forward to solve these problems. And so that structure, thinking about how to be urgent, how to be bold, and how to be concrete, is going to inform the way that we spend our time here together. The morning, we're going to focus on the urgent part. Um, and we're going to ha we have a very distinguished panel here. Um, the first panel um, highlights some best practices or some some things that we think um, we should study a little bit more to think about, could these be scaled up? Could this be done more? Could this be replicated? Could others do some of these things? What can we learn from these experiments? Um, and we'll do that in two parts. We'll first have a panel discussion, um, and then uh, we'll have a discussion session. And maybe I ought to mention sort of a slight quirk of formatting, because it's a little different from how we've done things in the past. Those of you who have come to our conferences before. Uh, we're going to have some public sessions. As you can see, there's a video camera here, and we're live streaming the event um, in part today. Um, but we're only live streaming part of it. We're live streaming the panel um, and with these remarks and, and, and the introductory panel. And then we're going to live stream the second uh, panel as well. The other parts of the day um, are going to be um, Chatham House rules. And we are going to have, uh, we're going to roll up our sleeves and we're going to have discussions um, and um, see what we can do um, to solve problems. But those, those parts of the, of the day will not be uh, videotaped. Um, and um, so we encourage you uh, to tweet um, or to discuss in public uh, the things that are um, dealt with in the public parts of the session where we've got a hashtag for today's event. We'll see if that works, um, which is A2M Harvard. Um, and uh, so we'd love uh, for public discussion on the public parts of this conversation, and we'd also ask you to respect um, the, um, uh, the more intimate nature of our intimate conversations. Um, so uh, in the afternoon, um, we will release ourselves from the constraint of thinking of things uh, that can be done in a, in a, in a very immediate sense, and um, our speakers and our panel um, will think deep thoughts about big, bold solutions to a serious and large problem. Um, we have uh, three freestanding three free speakers, um, all of whom are very distinguished. Uh, Rebecca Weintraub will talk about um, the role that pharmaceuticals play in overall health system strengthening. Um, uh, we have Jamie Love um, from uh, KEI, uh, who will talk about um, uh, the the possibility of delinkage um, and some of the some of the bold uh, thinking that he's done as an advocate in this space. Um, and then we have uh, Ruth Okedici, um, who will talk about her thoughts um, on access to medicines and uh, innovation and some of the thinking that uh, went into the UN um, Secretary General's High Commission on Access to Medicines. Then we'll have a panel uh, led by Suri Moon, 
um, that will um, continue the theme of looking at new approaches uh, to innovation and access, um, followed by a discussion session um, led by Terry Fisher um, that will uh, think about innovation and access um, in a um, in a forward-leaning and, and, and out-of-the-box uh, way. Um, so that's the bold part. Um, and then the last part, but I think should pervade the entire day, um, and we won't spend uh, that much time on at the end, but I hope we'll spend time on throughout the day, is thinking concretely about how we can work together. Um, the uh, Global Access in Action uh, program itself is a shoestring. We have no permanent staff. We have very, very little... Uh, resources, um, but we do have an aspiration to be actually impactful, and the way that we're going to do that is through partnerships with you um, and um, by spurring partnerships among you. Um, so, so I ask us in the sort of next step sense to think concretely about things we can do, um, but um, but I also want to you know sort of practice what we preach, um, and so uh, as part of today's. Um, conference, we put on the table some initial thoughts um, that were developed out of uh, Global Access in Action, a uh, draft paper um, that I think some of you have seen. Um, and um, the, that paper centers around three ideas we'd like to start by putting on the table. The first is um, that maybe differential pricing in particular, intra-country differential pricing of the kind um, that Hans Reitfeld from Novartis uh, will talk about, um, maybe offering drugs at different prices to different populations within the same jurisdictions offers some possibilities for dealing with a very difficult problem, which is that increasingly, the poor of the world live in jurisdictions where they are surrounded by affluent populations. And it is very difficult to ask the pharmaceutical industry to adopt a policy that involves simply reducing price for the entire developing world. And yet, the entire structure of innovation for um, investment in research and development depends upon some notion of recouping some of the investments that are made in research and development. Um, and intra-country price discrimination allows for a possible mechanism that um, could allow the charging of different prices to different populations within the same jurisdiction that may allow us to simultaneously create a replicable profit structure for industry and also enable and facilitate public health programs targeted the poorest members of those populations. So that's one possibility we put on the table. Second possibility we put on the table relates to the possibility of non-exclusive generic licensing partnerships as a mechanism for increasing the reach of corporate social responsibility programs. And one example um, that, we, that we'd like to, to delve into a little bit is the work that Gilead has done in the context of HIV AIDS in the world's poorest populations. One of the things that's attractive about this model is that um, it incorporates within it enough of a profit structure that it can potentially be scaled across many, many jurisdictions. One of the shortcomings of traditional corporate social responsibility programs, many of which are deeply impactful, um, is that they often um, rely upon a mechanism uh, that is net negative. And one of the attractive things about a non-exclusive generic li licensing partnership scheme is that it contains within it the seed of a mechanism for scaling itself and for allowing, uh, allowing industry participants to use it in a way that, um, that they may be able to scale across a vast number of jurisdictions and increase uh, access to medicines in a corresponding way. So that's the second idea that we put on the table. The third idea that we put on the table 
relates more, a little less to, to access um, structures and a little bit more to research and development. And this has to do with the notion um, that one of the greatest challenges um, for research and development into uh, some of the areas that primarily afflict, afflict the poor is lack of knowledge about some great research that exists in other um, parts of the innovation ecosystem. When the R&D shops for large industries um, look into solving a particular problem, they're often false starts, very expensive, very productive false starts. And those false starts are in many cases proprietary and very difficult to access for those who are trying to solve other problems. So I think of the idea of the post-it note. The post-it note was developed um, by 3M um, when they were looking actually for a pretty good adhesive. They were looking for how to develop a good glue. Um, and somebody developed a very bad glue. And somebody had an idea that having a very bad glue might actually be a very good idea. And the same thing happens in the pharmaceutical context. So um, the researchers who were developing um, the drug that became Viagra were actually looking for um, some cardiovascular uh, mechanisms of action, and they, um, they were able to develop something that had a totally different but unexpected use. The fact that innovation works in this quirky way actually opens up a very interesting possibility. And the interesting possibility um, is that if we can be a little bit more forward-leaning in sharing our false starts, in sharing the intellectual property that's developed on the corporate side with, um, uh, with entities that are primarily doing research into the drugs that afflict the global poor, uh, we may have opportunities um, to unlock that hidden treasure um, and uh, to allow for greater um, progress on solving the problems um, where there aren't commercial incentives to solve those problems. Um, so we can look uh, into those mechanisms a little bit more as well. Um, so in order to do this, I'd love to call to the front um, our four distinguished panelists um, in the first panel. Um, there's uh, Greg and uh, Hans and Prashant and Colleen, if you could come up. Sure, that'd be great. If it doesn't matter. Yeah. I actually watched the hockey game. Oh, great. Was the they lost. Great. Um, so we have four distinguished panelists here today. Greg Alton is, um, is, from, is the executive vice president um, for commercial and access operations at Gilead Pharmaceuticals. Um, and he'll speak first. And then we have Hans Reitfeld um, from um, the Malaria Access Initiative within Novartis. Uh, we have Prashant Yadav from the University of Michigan, and we have Colleen Chen um, from the Santa Clara Law School. Um, but without further ado, I'll turn it over 